Hello, everyone. Uh, good night. Welcome again to one of my uh, webinars. Um, today, we're going to be talking about one uh, topic that I like. Um, I hope you have a lot of questions for me. I'm going to give that time for questions at the end of the presentation. Your microphones are going to be muted through the presentation, but they're going to you're going to have time at the end. Remember, my presentations come from my experience as a doctor, uh, but they do not replace a medical consultation. Also, I would like to um, remind you that uh, if you have further questions before the seminar, you can go into brightbot.com and record your video questions, uh, and me or someone else will um, answer those questions for you. Um, I would like to thank Brightbot.com for sponsoring this presentation. So uh, let's begin. Today we're going to talk about breast cancer and I uh, decided to title my presentation Time is Gold. Um, my name is Jaime Meza. I'm a medical doctor. As some of you already know me, I work uh, mainly in the emergency room, but I also work with chronic diseases and conditions, mostly cancer. Uh, so this is one of the topics I like the most. I always like to begin my presentations with some numbers just to put some context in, in, in the presentation. Breast cancer in the United States, well, it's very important, not only in the United States, in the world, but specifically here. Um, it's the most common type of cancer in women. Um, no matter age or uh, I mean age matters but not ethnicity or, or racial group um, one in eight women will have uh, breast cancer in the throughout their lives uh, that means about every year 2,000 more than 2,100 women will have it and one in every six women will die from from it. That means 40,000 women every year in the United States die because of um, breast cancer. There in the right uh, lower corner, you'll find a little statistic for men, which is not very usual to find men in this topic, but uh, it is also important. It is not as common as in women, actually for every 100 women, women that have it, only one man have it, but it's very lethal in men. So about 400 men in the United States die every year due to um, breast cancer. So it is also important for us. But what is breast cancer? I've talked before about other cancers and they are all very similar. Um, in this case, uh, there is a it is a condition in which there is an abnormal cell multiplication. Um, let's say um, an abnormal cell division. Here, there's a little picture of a breast, uh, which some of, of the parts, so you can understand a little bit more of what, what is happening. There are mainly two types of breast cancer. Uh, in the most common one, the cells that are affected are the cells of the lactiferous ducts, which are the little ducts or tubes that carry the milk from where it's produced to the nipple. In that type of cancer, uh, well, that type of cancer, we call it ductal carcinoma. It is the most common type of cancer. More than 85% of the breast cancers are ductal carcinomas. The other place that can be affected, not as much as the ducts, but uh, can be, it's the uh, lobules, which are the actual place where the milk is produced. That type of cancer, we call it lobular carcinoma. Those two probably are more than 95% of breast cancers. There are some other types, very rare, so I'm going to focus uh, on these two types of cancer today. Here, here you see a little bit the numbers where I'm talking about. When I'm talking about the ducts, I'm talking about number six, a 
there. So that's why I wrote the, the, the little six and the, and the lobules are number three. So that help you, helps you a little bit more to visualize where, where the problem might be. What are the symptoms of breast cancer? It is, it is very important for you to know this. Probably you've heard it a lot, but I would like to clarify a little bit more. So redness of the breast, yes, definitely. This is one of the, of the most um, alarming uh, symptom. It's not, I wouldn't say it's the most common symptom, but you have to pay attention to that, especially if it's asymmetrical. That means it's only affecting one of your breasts. Also asymmetry itself, uh, which is having a breast that's bigger than the other one. Uh, that's another symptom. Of course, we have to understand that uh, for every woman, uh, there's a little bit of asymmetry. Breasts are not exactly the same. Uh, one is always bigger than the other, but um, th this asymmetry is almost uh, always very, not very obvious. Of course, women know because they know themselves, so they already know that they have one breast that's bigger than the other, but that, 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 that's almost impossible to see for for somebody else different from the actual patient. But if you have developing, you're developing a asymmetry, one of your breasts is growing or actually shrinking, that can happen also, that's a, a, um, a symptom. If you're, you're having pain or itchiness of the breast, that's also another symptom. Um, if you feel there is any change in the skin of the breast, that is a symptom. But um, actually what we call orange skin, that is the most, I would say the most alarming because that, that means the um, um, certain part of the breast, which is the lymphatic uh, ducts are getting clogged. So you have the skin in the breast starts to look like the skin of the orange. So if that happens, that's definitely a symptom. And the also the, the last one is the, the swelling of the lymph nodes, which is very common, unfortunately. So that can be a little bit misleading because every time you have an infection, the lymph nodes are gonna swell. Uh, it's very common that if you have like an um, ear infection or a throat infection, uh, your, your lymph nodes in the neck are gonna get swollen. And if you have an infection on your hands, on your nails, on your fingers, on your arm, then the lymph nodes in your, in your armpit are gonna get swollen, that's normal. But of course, if you see this, these nodes are swollen without you having any infection, any disease, any, any, anything in your skin, and if they, that persists for more than 20 days a month, that's something you should, you should uh, get seen just to check if it might be something. How do we diagnose um, breast cancer? Uh, we have different techniques, different images that we can use uh, in, in our daily practice. The first one there on your left is the regular mammogram. It is widely used, not only in the United States, but in almost everywhere in the world. It's still the, um, gold standard for uh, screening, not necessarily for diagnosis, but for screening at least. Um, so that's the most uh, used image. Also, we have uh, breast ultrasound. We use it when we're not sure uh, if there's something in the mammogram or, or, or we wanna clarify something, so we use it. And the third one right there in your right corner is the breast MRI. It is useful in certain conditions, not very commonly used for this, but it can be used, especially in women that have um, breast implants. We like, to, we like to use the MRI because it, it, can, uh, it can be a little bit difficult to do um, the regular mammogram. And it's also, it also has certain risks. Of course, if you have ever gotten a mammogram, you know how it is. 
I'm gonna explain to you, but here's a little image of bas basically how everything is done. So there you see that the breast needs to be like uh, squished, I don't know how to say it, a little bit. So if you have an implant there, it might cause certain problems. The ultrasound is very simple. Basically you have like, uh, like a part that it's emitting sound waves. It's not painful, it's, uh, well, it can be a little bit uncomfortable, but not painful. And the MRI, it's, uh, well, that machine you go through has like magnets around it so you cannot use metal. But though there are very simple tests, um, not very painful. Probably the mammogram is the one that causes more um, troubles and discomfort in women, but it's the one we use the most because it's the cheapest. It's actually very effective. Um, so that's, that's how we do it. Then what happens if you find something abnormal in any of these um, images? What we do is that the diagnosis needs to be um, done by pathology. That means a doctor that specialized in pathology needs to see some tissue in the microscope and actually determine if that tissue is cancer or not. So of course we need to do a biopsy. <clears throat> um, there are several ways of doing this biopsy. Uh, usually it is guided by certain image. Of course, from the outside of the breast, it is impossible for us to know actually where the, where the part where we think the cancer might be is. So we use either ultrasound or uh, mammogram also to guide the needle to the exact place. It just takes a little part of the tissue and it goes to the pathologist. He'll be um, looking at that in the microscope, putting cer certain dyes uh, on it, and then he'll, he'll tell us if that is um, benign or it's cancer. So it is a process that takes some time, but now since this is a problem that's affecting so many uh, women, um, since the moment you have a mammogram done till it's diagnosed, probably it can be less than two weeks, something about 10, day, 10 days. <clears throat> How do we treat um, this cancer? It's, it, it depends. Actually, the treatment may be very different depending on which stage you got diagnosed. Uh, usually, nowadays, it is diagnosed on time very early. We just find some little tissue that's actually uh, even smaller than a, than a regular, um, like the size of a, of a fingernail, even smaller, half that size probably. So that tissue needs to be um, removed. So we, we do something that's called a lumpectomy. We take that lump out and usually this uh, works. Of course, it has to have certain conditions for us to know that this worked. Condition number one is that there are no lymph nodes affected because cancer, not only in the breast, but in other places of the body, it uh, travels to the, through the lymphatic um, system. That's how it goes from the breast to the bone or to the, or to the brain or other parts of the body. So if there are no lymph nodes affected, that means the cancer has not um, traveled outside of the breast. So it is safe just to locally remove it. If there is uh, some affection in the lymphatic nodes, then probably what we need to do is the second surgery, which is probably the, the one that you know um, more, which is the mastectomy. Mastectomy is the removal of the whole breast. There are actually several uh, different mastectomies, um, depending on how aggressive and how advanced is the cancer. Uh, many uh, women or patients do know, don't know that, the, um, that there are several types of mastectomy. They all think that it's the same one, but it's not. Sometimes we just remove the, I mean, the nipple is always removed because nipple has the ducts. And as I was telling you, the ductal uh, carcinoma is the one that's most common. 
So of course the nipple is always um, going to be removed. But then we have to take all the ducts and probably most of the um, of the lobules. But that's it. In some women, we have to take the muscle away. So the pectoral mus muscle that's under that has to be removed also because the cancer is so aggressive that it has gone there. So that's why uh, certain surgeries are so um, disfiguring for, so, for certain patients. And of course, that makes this condition um, uh, a condition that also affects the self-esteem of the patients. I'm talking about women because, as I was telling you, this is more common in women. And for men, having mastectomy, uh, it wouldn't be such a problem because we're not used to have breasts. So, of course, this is something that affects much more than simply just your physical um, appearance. <clears throat> uh, we can also um, help the surgical process with some chemotherapy and with uh, some radiotherapy, which is those two are very commonly used for other types of cancer. What is what's special about the, um, the breast cancer, um, talking about the treatment with chemotherapy is that um, when we take some tissue of that cancer to be um, studied by the pathologist, after he diagnosed it, I mean, after he said he, those were malignant cells and what type of cancer, he does some special tests to see if that tissue has certain specific conditions. What conditions, for example, um, now they do as a routine something that is, that is called the HER. Um, also, they do uh, estrogen receptor, and which is the ER, and the PR, which is the progestin receptor. Why? Because these types of cancer are very uh, the ones that have those receptors. Um, they they are very, they are controlled by hormonal levels, by estrogens and progestins also. So that helps the doctor choose what kind of treatment they're gonna have. Not every cancer is the same. So if you have, if, if that patient patient's cancer has those receptors, well, there we're gonna choose one, um, one drug or chemotherapy that targets those hormones. So the breast tissue is not gonna, the malignant tissue is not gonna grow as fast as it would normally do. So this is very, very um, helpful now, very special to these types of cancer that uh, respond to hormonal levels. But unfortunately there are certain cases which are negative. So that means there's this type of, of um, medications won't, be useful in those patients. So th those are more aggressive types of cancer, more difficult to actually treat. Who is at risk? Uh, of course, women are a hundred times more at risk than men, but we're both at risk. Age is definitely one of the most important risk factors here. It is, although we do see certain uh, young patients with breast cancer, it is more common in uh, women age 50 and older, even 60 or 65, that it's more common. Uh, if you have family history of cancer, meaning a uh, relative in first degree, that's also, it increases the risk of having breast cancer. Um, having genetic markers, uh, there is a gene, actually several genes, but the mo most uh, important here are called the BRCA, which are the breast cancers, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2. These are certain genetic mutations of certain uh, genes that uh, we actually test certain patients. And uh, nowadays, if they have family history of breast cancer and they have the BRCA um, genes positive, in some cases, we do recommend uh, prophylactic mastectomy, which means that even when they don't have cancer now, the risk they're gonna develop it in the future, it's too high. So some patients 
uh, go through the surgery before actually developing uh, any symptoms. So it, it is very, um, it's, a, it's a good thing we have nowadays. Uh, unfortunately, not many women are BRCA positive. Most, more than 80% of patients with um, breast cancer do not have family members with breast cancer and are probably not positive for this gene. So this is very limited, but for some patients it is useful. Um, patients who had their first menstrual period uh, very young, they are at risk because of course, if they had their first menstrual period young, that means their hormones started to, um, let, let's say, increase at a younger age. So as I was telling you, this cancer is very responsive to hormones, so they are at risk. Also, uh, women who uh, went in the menopause in older age, because of course, the menopause is when the um, when basically certain hormones, uh, well, well, basically when the women stop having their their uh, menstrual periods, they don't have any more eggs uh, in their ovaries, so that the hormones stop or certain hormone at least decreases their it, its level, so it doesn't create any more risk. But if you are older, older than 50, 51, 52, and still having your menstrual periods, that means you still have certain hormonal levels that are in a, in a high level, so that means you're at risk also. That um, image, it's a little, uh, I, I don't know, particular. I, I chose it because that's the way we learn it. Um, women that have no children are at higher risk. Uh, who never got pregnant are, are at higher risk of breast cancer. So uh, this is not necessarily the 100% of the times, but nuns are at very high risk because most nuns have no children. Uh, children, sorry. Uh, but of course, that can happen to a person that is not a nun, nun, of course, and didn't have any children. So people with no children um, have are at higher risk. And unfortunately, higher body mass index, which is uh, obesity, it's related. So if you've seen my previous webinars, you know that obesity is a risk factor for most of the conditions we've talked about. So that's something we should really address. What can be done about breast cancer? Uh, and it's the reason why I chose to um, call my presentation Time is Gold, because it's very easy to uh, help and to diagnose uh, breast cancer early. The first step is breast self exams. That is what I would like to um, tell you today, like the main message here. Please do it. This goes for um, both men and women, but of course, um, women as they're more affected, this is more to you. So try to do it in the once a month at least, in the second or third day after your period, because that, that that's the point where the hormones are, are the um, lowest in your body. Uh, always try to do it either in the shower, in your bed while you're uh, lying down, or both places. Why is this? Because in the shower, usually with water and soap, it is easier to actually examine, like going, putting your fingers and letting them go through your skin, it's easier. And why when you're lying on your bed? Because it is different if you're standing up, because the breast tissue tends to go down uh, so it, it will be a little bit more difficult, but if you're laying down, it will all go backwards and it will let you actually feel a little bit more. Um, so that's my recommendation. Do it with four fingers, this four fingers you're seeing here. Go up and down, go in circles, go from the nipple around. Uh, always taking, uh, always uh, going and palpating your armpit because that's one place we have a lot of troubles with. First, because 
uh, most women examine their breasts but not the armpit so they have certain abnormalities there they're not going to be able to figure out um, on time and also the mammograms um, they do not catch that part very well so it, it would be very helpful if you could do it also when you go to the doctor we usually do uh, an exam um, and we try to uh, check the armpit also as I was telling you before, check the color, check the skin, and check the nipple. Uh, when, when there's malignant tissue and there's cancer in the breast, it usually starts retracting all the tissue. So the nipple might um, actually either start um, producing uh, like liquid, like similar to, the, to milk, or it might actually go inwards. So if you suddenly, that, that's normal for certain women, but if you, from one day to another, you saw that that happened, especially if it's only to one of your breasts, that's something you should actually uh, go to the doctor to be checked. And of course, the mammogram. There's a little, um, not controversy, but a little disagreement between the, um, the American Cancer Society about when uh, the um, mammograms, mammograms should be done. Um, but I would say after age 45, it should be done at least a year. The disagreement is, is if it should be after 50 or 45, and if it should be done every year or every two years. Since, uh, it's not harming anyone now, or at least the, the benefit is better than the problem it might cause us. I would still think that it's uh, worth doing it every year after uh, age 45. That might change in the future, but at least that's the recommendations today, so you should do it. Um, it's a little bit uncomfortable. I'm not gonna say it's not, but I think it's worth it. It's just, probably have an hour of discomfort or even less. Uh, and it's a whole year of peace of mind. So um, please do it. Uh, actually, the American Cancer Society has a program and it, it can be free. If you go to um, community health centers, probably you're gonna be able to find people who can tell you more about the program. So please go ahead and do it. And uh, Let's start with the questions. You know, I really enjoy your questions, so let's go ahead. I hope you like the presentation. I know there are certain things that might be missing, but sometimes um, that's a good thing, so you can ask further questions, um, and hopefully I can answer all of them. Dr. Mesa, have you ever heard of the term phylodes? Yes. Can you explain? Well, phylodes, it's one type, one type of, of um, disease and one type of cancer uh, of the, um, it's a type of tumor that, that can grow. Um, it's one of those rare types that I didn't mention here because it's not that, um, not that common. Uh, it, it presents when it's in the breast, uh, a phylotis tumor. It's a little bit more aggressive, although it's more local. Um, you can find, um, um, let's say you can, um, the symptoms are a little bit more uh, aggressive than the normal tumors and the treatment it usually it's surgery because uh, it doesn't respond to the, to the um, hormonal blocks that we usually use. Um, it, it is very, um, it affects a lot, of, a lot of the skin and the nipple area also, um, but it's, it's not very common. That's basically what, can, what, what I can tell you right now. Okay. Dr. Mesa. Yes. I've heard that um, typically 
when you are diagnosed with breast cancer, and if it's only in one breast, that most of the time it's recommended that you remove both. What is your take on that? Mm, the removal of um, both breasts when you were diagnosed one, it depends. Um, it depends, I, I would think, in the type of cancer that you had in one of your breasts. Um, if it's, if you have, first of all, if you have the BRCA gene positive uh, and you had uh, hormonal uh, markers that are positive, then that, that might be reasonable to suggest bilateral mastectomy just because the risk of developing breast cancer in your other breast is high. So that would it's not a very normal case, but if you have those specific conditions, then it might be um, reasonable to suggest that. It's, or at least if they don't do it, you have to be screened very often, probably more than once a year, because your, your um, risk of developing breast cancer might be um, high. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, you were talking about the symptoms before, and you were talking about like redness, pain, and itchiness. Um, are like what symptom? If there has been any studies, like the most common for women, or are the symptoms kind of random? Well, uh, basically, if you let time pass, the, the all the symptoms are going to appear eventually. Um, of course they appear first what symptom appears first depends on what part and what type of cancer they have as i was telling you for example in the most common type of cancer which is the um the ductal carcinoma uh probably the nipple is not going to be affected until the tumor grows enough so probably the changes on the skin are going to be first and also uh probably a palpable mass, a lump. Of course, if, if time goes by, the rest of the symptoms are going to appear. The other hand, if you have a, um, I mean, a lobular carcinoma, then probably you will have the opposite. Um, but eventually, they are all going to appear. The most common symptom is actually um, having just a lump, not even pain, that's the most common symptom, if there is no symptom at all, because nowadays we actually discover cancer without it having any symptoms, because the technology now let us do that. But when they do, it's usually a lump. Pain, it's also very common, although it's not a very, uh, it's a very low, mild pain, and um, changes on the skin. In some types of cancer, like phyllotis, that they were, somebody asked me about, and inflammatory um, cancer of the of the breast, which is another type of cancer, probably redness and the uh, asymmetry of the breasts are going to be more uh, like the main symptoms of th those types of cancer. But to, like I was telling you, it all changes depending on the patient, where the cancer is, like in what part of the breast, and um, and, and how, how early is it diagnosed? Hey, sir. Yes. Um, back to the symptoms. Um, let's say somebody has, uh, is of a darker complexion and we're looking to see redness. So you're probably not going to see red because of the person's complexion. Um, how would that manifest itself? Would it be it would change to a deep, a different color, or you know, how would you use that as a way of looking for a symptom? Well, yes, as you were, it's sometimes difficult. I mean, yeah. when yeah. Some, it's sometimes difficult just to uh, just to uh, notice a symptom uh, when when it's just as um, slight as a color change, as you were saying, some people's. Uh, skin color doesn't let, let, let us actually know that we have it. So I wish there was um, an easy trick for you, for you to tell, but in this case, it, there isn't. Let's say that color might be actually uh, one of the symptoms that it's more subjective. 
So it, what, I, what I think is more um, important here is that as doctors, we are used to see breasts every day, but we see the breasts of every patient and every patient is different. In the other hand, the patient sees her breasts every day. So she is the expert in her breast. So there are certain things that she might notice that for us doctors, we, we won't even pay attention to that. Maybe it's, the color is not, might not be the easiest thing to notice, but you can actually notice a change in the shape, in the, um, uh, con I don't know, the, well, color, the, um, how should I say, the, um, how it feels. So I think maybe the color, yes, it can be difficult in certain patients, but everything you notice that's different as an expert in your own breast, that is sufficient enough to go to a doctor and to tell us. Because as I was telling you, for us, it's normal. We see breasts every day. We, we, we examine breasts. Under everyone, ha I mean, a lot of patients have lumps or asymmetries or even color changes, but for them, that's normal. They've had it all of their lives. That's not why, why they're actually there. So it, it, your information, it's very useful. So I think that can help us a little bit more than just simply the color. Because yes, it is definitely difficult sometimes just for that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Dr. Mesa, I have another question. If there's a family history of, of breast cancer, is it still recommended that you do your first mammogram at age 45? Um, well, no. Uh, definitely family history is one of the, one of the uh, risk factors. So that means you should, you should get screened before. Um, it also depends. Uh, when we have somebody who, with a family member who is first degree that had breast cancer, we do the genetic testing first just to see if they have BRCA uh, genes positive or not. That's through a blood test. And if they do, then we start the screening more often. If they do not have the genes positive, then they are still at higher risk. But um, I guess it's a decision of the physician. If I'm the one who's gonna do it, I would probably uh, start it at 40 um, also, not younger, if the patient has not symptoms. If they feel anything, I would just go ahead and do it uh, because of course the, the risk is higher, but uh, I guess it depends also in the, in the genes. Unfortunately, as I said before, uh, usually that's not the case. Usually um, most women with breast cancers do not have family history of that and are not BRCA positive. But for those women who have that special condition, which is very related to the question you did previously, uh, they do, uh, they have to be screened uh, more often and at a younger age. Um, doctor, um, you had mentioned mm -hmm. that you. you had mentioned that um, breast cancer in men. You used the term uh, lethal. Um, I took that to mean like higher mortality rates. Uh, right. My question is: Is that due to you know that in, in women? Is that due to the fact that men probably have, shall we say, less real estate in that area? Well. Um, the the breast tissue in man it's very similar and yet very different from uh, women's breasts. Usually, of course, um, we never produce milk, and it doesn't grow in response to uh, the horm hormones because we do not produce those female hormones in sufficient quantity. If we start doing it by some reason, then we will develop very similar breasts. But here, the, 
the since I, I already told you that the cancer develops in the ducts or in the lobules where the milk is produced, you have, we have to realize that most uh, like the the the, bre uh, the breast, it's made mostly of fatty tissue. It's fat. It's only a small part that's actually made of tubules, ducts, and lobules. Uh, in the men, since we don't have big breasts, we only have what what's remnant of that tissue. It's probably the only the ducts, which are atrophied, but they're still there, and the um, and the lobules. So uh, when cancer strikes in men, it, the tissue that's affected, it's only, I mean, we have less um, of other tissue to be affected, less fat, le less other, the tissue we have there, it's only the, um, the, the ducts which are atrophied, but they're, they're still there. So it, metastasize faster, easier, and probably we don't check as often as women. So of course it's gonna be diagnosed later also. So those little um, things make that for us, the diagnosis is gonna be late. It's gonna be more uh, with a higher mortality rate. That That's okay. And um, one, one last thing, sir. Um, You'd uh, mentioned, you said, um, you mentioned in passing about implants in women. And I was just curious, does that, do implants correlate to any kind of a like a higher rate or lower rate of breast cancer or does it, does it matter at all? Uh, not, not, not that I know, at least not now. Usually we, nowadays, implants are only saline. So yeah. even if they burst or they break they're not going to be harmful in that that matter so i i wouldn't think so okay thank you okay uh, dr mesa can you um explain what the BRCA gene is please well uh there there are certain genes that we call uncle genes which means genes that are uh, present in the population and we through um, studies have linked those genes to um, certain types of cancer. Actually BRCA might be called a gene mutation because um, we all need genes uh, to genes okay let's let's start with this genes are like the code that tells the cell what to do, what to create, what to produce. So that's, that's the, the genes. It's a little code like instructions. But we all share the same instructions, but the words we use are slightly different one cell, one person to the other. Um, so the variations in this language to do to, to, to command the same thing, we call that mutations. So um, when certain mutations, certain variation of that language uh, makes uh, the cell produce and do that command, but also produce some bad consequence like cancer, we call that an oncogene. In this case, for uh, breast cancers, we have ad identify a certain part of the DNA, which we decided to call breast cancer. Um, I'm not sure if it's anti or antigen one and two. There actually is more than two, but those two are the most uh, commonly seen in patients with uh, gene-related breast cancer. Basically, I don't know if that explained very good, but basically that's what it is. So in one sense, having uh, BRCA mutation is a bad thing, but uh, on the other hand, it can also signal to a, a person uh, that that breast cancer is imminent. Is that right? Well, definitely having BRCA1 and 2, it's a signal that 
you should be very, I mean, you should be aware. As I was telling you, sometimes uh, if they have family history and BRCA uh, genes present, it is advisable to do prophylactic mastectomy because in those cases, BRCA1 and 2 are not uh, slightly related. They are actually very strong. They have a very strong relationship with the cancer. So I, I would say that those patients with BRCA1 and 2 have a risk, a very, very, very high risk, almost certain that they're going to have breast cancer. There are not a lot of patients who have it, but those who do have that mutation, they are at very, very high risk to developing uh, the breast cancer. So, of course, if you have it, most of the, of the times they're going to be checked more of, often and even um, do prophylactic mastectomy on them. And do men also uh, get the BRCA mutation? We, we can. We can have it because those genes are are um, present both men and women. Usually, every every gene is present in both. Only only certain very very little genes that are related to the X chromosome, which this is not the case. So we do have it also. We do not test it in men regularly because of the low. Um, incidence of breast cancer in, in men, but we could have it also. Um, yeah, the answer is yeah, it can be present. Dr. Mesa. Yes. If you've had, if you've had breast cancer, develop cancer somewhere else in your body, if you've had breast cancer. Sorry, could you repeat the question? If, if you've had breast cancer, would it be possible, would it be more likely that you develop cancer somewhere else in your body or not necessarily? Um, there is a certain relation with um, endometrial cancer and cervical cancer, um, but let me tell you about that relationship. Um, there, is, there are certain medications, especially one that we use that's called tamoxifen, uh, or, or other type of um, hormonal, um, let's say, um, hormonal blocking medicine that um, creates certain risk for, um, for, for having endometrial cancer, which is a type of, of um, uterus cancer. Since these two types of cancer uh, respond to hormonal misbalances, uh, usually uh, they correlate in the opposite way. So, peop, uh, so when you have breast cancer, that means you have certain hormones that are um, at a higher level, so you're probably not going to have endometrial cancer. But then the paradox is that the medicines used to treat that cancer might actually increase your risk to have an endometrial cancer. So we do test that those patients more often just to, to be sure they're not developing that. So that's the relationship in that specific case. For the rest of cancer, no, not really. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Again, thanks, brightbot.com, for sponsoring this webinar. So I hope you can make the, the next one. Remember, if you have any questions right now or maybe later, you can go into brightbot.com and record a video with your questions, and uh, they will be answered. Um, have a very, very good night. I love your questions, um, and hope we can meet in next Tuesday.